in Japan, we like uh, bathing in hot mineral baths. And uh, today I'll be talking about uh, how that relates to jellyfish. A uh, list of my co-authors here, uh, many people are, who are in the room here, and it's a collaborative project where you really need everybody to uh, have brought all of this together. So um, exactly what would happen as the, the uh, global ocean warms, uh, people say it might be more jellies, some people have say no, not really, uh, we don't know yet. Uh, but all of these uh, predictions have been based on lots of data. There were 37 data sets went into the, uh, the figure in that uh, paper by Condon et al. on the right. Uh, for the deep sea, uh, this is uh, distributions and uh, species occurrences in 3D, uh, just as Gerlin was saying, and there's not very much away from the uh, coastlines and not very much in most of the midwater. The figure on the right is uh, a poster child, a Gina citrea, four tentacles, the only Nakamajusa with four tentacles. Uh, therefore, that was what they used for their distributional model to see how things will change by 2050. And uh, that single species actually included seven different cryptic species in different families uh, as well. The papers at the, the barcode there, uh, the QR code. And so a lot of the data on the distributions was actually wrong. Uh, probably less than 10% of those points were actually Aegina citrea. All right, so what do we do about that kind of stuff? Uh, this is uh, the proposed mesopelagic ecoregions of the world's oceans. So uh, ideally, we'd want to go to each of these ecoregions and see how they're different. Uh, the actual ROV-based gelatinous fauna diversity data that we have for more than two dives uh, are these little smiley faces. And you can see that uh, we don't cover very many of the bioregions uh, that we would really want to look at to model worldwide because uh, these distribution data modeling is, gets highly skewed by having too many data points in a very well-surveyed area uh, compared to non-well-surveyed areas. <coughs> so the two places where most of the information come from is the Monterey Bay, where Ambari have been uh, doing ROV dives for decades, and uh, off Japan. Uh, and here's a comparison of what the zero to 1,000 meters looks like. And you'll see with Monterey Bay, uh, there's lots of siphonophores in the shallow, shallower layers and uh, the Medusae are a bit deeper. Whereas you see with the Sagami Bay, we had the Medusae were shallow and the siphonophores were deep. So we're basing our, uh, what we know about the mesopelagic around the world as we see it with ROVs based on these two places which are both very different to each other. Hmm. Uh, I know et al. did uh, work in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge data and they have species occurrences uh, list, but with nets it's very hard to get relative abundances because some animals are broken up and don't survive, whereas others are. Uh, so you really need to be working with ROVs as much as you can. Uh, this is bathypelagic from 1,000 to 3,500 meters uh, depth in Monterey Bay on the left. Uh, the green is a unsegmented polychaete worm, Peobius, in very, very large uh, numbers. Uh, on the right is the clarion clipperton zone, where we've recently been doing environmental impact assessments for deep sea mining. The pie graphs, the uh, red lines there are denoting the uh, gelatinous fauna, uh, which are not worms. The worms are in pink. Uh, and these depths, uh, 1,500 to 2,000, 2,000 to 500, to 500 and below. So you see they're very different, again, between Monterey Bay and the clarion clipperton zone, which are the only two places where we have abyssopelagic uh, gelatinous fauna information. So what do we actually know? It's not very much. Is there anything we can do about it? How can we model future scenarios when the data is so limited? So our idea was to use submerged calderas as proxies for a global warming ocean. And uh, off Japan, we have several volcanic undersea mountain ranges. And 
the first uh, place we looked at was the Kurose Hall, which uh, has uh, 110 meters is the shallowest point. It's 820 meters at the floor. And uh, the other place is the Smith Caldera. And we did dives inside and outside. So at the same latitude, longitude, pretty much, we were able to compare uh, the fauna there. The Kurose Hall here, uh, as you can see, the temperature outside uh, is four degrees down at 800 meters because we have the cold or derived waters is coming in from the north whereas the Kurose Hole, the rim, stops these cold waters from coming in and it's geothermally heated from below. There's no vent, but it's warmer at 11 degrees uh, at the sea floor. This was in the year 2000. And what we found was inside the caldera, there was a very low diversity compared to outside, uh, but there were many more animals there than there were on the outside. And the most common animal inside was this uh, one animal, Illyria brunei, used to be Forsteria brunei. And uh, on the left there, the bar chart, you can see that it occurred mostly around the seafloor. Uh, and there was not a single animal seen on the outside. This was actually originally uh, described from uh, waters east of India. And this was the second record ever inside a caldera uh, with none outside <laughs> of Japan. So we revisited the Kurose Hall uh, 20 years later just to see uh, how things had changed, if the jellyfish was still there. And uh, we found, no, we couldn't find these, this uh, Illyria brunei in there anymore. And instead, the whole caldera was full of Coleodus sloni, the viper fish, uh, in one video frame, you could probably count 30 or 40, and uh, it's the highest concentration ever seen uh, on the planet. Again, the caldera has warmed up in that time from 11 degrees at uh, the bottom to 18 degrees now, and uh, we're going back there to see what's happened in February, March, uh, to go and see if it's even warmer, uh, and if the viper fish are there, or the jellyfish have made a comeback, or if it's going to erupt and wipe out Tokyo. <clears throat> so, and this is the Smith Caldera. Uh, the Smith Caldera is also warmer inside, only 10 degrees versus 5 degrees outside. And the lip of the caldera is deeper than the Kurose Hole. It's at 400 meters or so. This is a comparison between the Kurose Hole and Smith Caldera. And uh, we found that the diversity was highest on the outside of both calderas. Uh, next highest diversity was inside the vent caldera, and then the lowest diversity was inside the non-vent vent caldera. Whereas the population density was the opposite, with the inside the non-vent caldera had the most animals, and then inside the vent caldera, and outside the caldera is not so many. Interestingly enough, inside the Smith's caldera, we also found large numbers of Illyria brunei. Uh, associated at the same depth as the vent plume, possibly feeding on vent larvae or something like that, uh, which was pretty cool. And uh, of the tinafores, uh, there were many, many lobates. On the outside, mostly in shallow waters, and on the inside of the caldera, a uh, very large proportion of lobates uh, down in the deeper areas. Uh, the lobate morphotypes that were abundant inside the caldera, uh, there was an undescribed family of, uh, of lobate there. And the warm inside caldera community was very different to the cold uh, outside community. Uh, shameless plug here. Uh, this is a new subfamily, new species genus subfamily of Ulmarid uh, medusae, which was just published on Monday of this week. And this is also only found in the Smith's caldera. So far, we've seen three individuals, uh, all in the Smith's caldera. We've done hundreds of hours of dives uh, in other places, and we've never seen it anywhere else. Uh, so keep your eyes out and tell me if you see anything that looks like this. The barcode will take you to the press release. And uh, it was very strange because St. Georgia, uh, this Medusa, was closest genetically to uh, different subfamilies in the Olmarids, uh, 
uh, of jellies that don't have tentacles on their bell rim. Uh, San Giordia also does not have tentacles on its bell rim. They're actually under the sub-umbrella on the surface. Uh, we probably should have erected a new family, but we didn't have uh, good enough genetic data to uh, erect multiple families instead of putting everything in, in, in the Olmaridae, so we've just uh, placed it there for now as a subfamily. <coughs> okay, so what are the other target areas that we can go to? We've done what we can around Japan. Uh, so we look at our uh, biogeographic region area and we see some interesting places with warm uh, water temperatures, uh, the Mediterranean and the Red Sea, of course, uh, but also the Sulu Sea, which is uh, a sea which is surrounded by Malaysia, Indonesia, and the Philippines. It also has very shallow rims. Inside this sea, uh, 10 degrees Celsius down at 5,000 meters, and uh, it has less saline but warm waters uh, down in the deep areas. The Hakuhomaru, which is the University of Tokyo uh, ship, went there and sampled with an INS net, no ROV, uh, unfortunately. But uh, in the Celebes Sea, the station in the Celebes Sea had lots of classified si siphonophores, the rocket ship siphonophores, uh, that are big enough that you can also see with an ROV, so uh, it's a good target to be looking for, but they're very uh, common and uh, presumably important in the deep sea uh, outside these kinds of enclosed basins. We didn't see, we didn't catch any in the Sulu Sea, so a whole family of siphonophores is missing. Uh, there are lots of anthemedusae in the Sulu Sea where we didn't see so many in the, uh, the Celebes Sea as well. So again, very different, uh, even though they're very close to each other in terms of uh, geography. So it wasn't just the classifieds that were absent. Uh, there was only one out of five species of the multi-striate lensia uh, siphonophores. Deep sea lensias were missing, gilia reticulata missing, siphonophore frillagalma, botrynema brucei was missing, but uh, there were some deep sea uh, cnidarians that were there. So it's not that deep sea cnidarians can't live there, it's just that uh, taxonomically, some taxonomic groups are unable to live there in the deep sea uh, when it's warm. Is it because there's physiological barriers uh, or not? We're not really sure. But uh, in the case of uh, the classifieds, we uh, have some information from the Mediterranean as well. And uh, we did some surveys there with the group from uh, Barcelona, ICM Seek in 2013, the fish jelly cruisers. And uh, we did find one classifier there. It's the basal group for the classifieds, uh, the genus Kephis was there, but uh, no others. And so we have a list of animals that are missing in the Mediterranean as well. Uh, we look at this on a global scale and we see in the warm waters, uh, whether they're hot warm water, uh, whether they're high salinity warm waters or whether they're low salinity warm waters, uh, there's various taxa that are missing. Uh, the one hole we have in the data there was the Red Sea. So uh, we teamed up with KAUST and took their ROV out uh, to do some surveys in the Red Sea. Uh, we found Solmandella by Tentaculata, which is found in the Arctic, the Antarctic, Southeast Asia, absolutely everywhere in the Red Sea as well. So there's probably more than one species hidden there. And uh, we've got a proposal in to go back with a, a big oceanographic uh, vessel and an ROV uh, from Jamstech, so uh, keep your eyes on that space. So <clears throat> uh, what else is it that uh, uh, we can do here? Monterey Bay has an amazing data set. Uh, the bar graph on the left is the classified uh, that they have in their data set, and on the right is Botrynema. These are the two uh, taxonomic groups that are missing in the warm deep waters. Unfortunately, for the small cryptic taxa, they're very difficult to see with ROVs and even more difficult to identify to species level. So it's a, a total number of 13 versus hundreds and hundreds for those other large animals. So we really do need more data, uh, which will have to be caught with nets or shadow graph cameras, perhaps, uh, uh, to get some of this distribution data in other areas for the smaller uh, animals. But in the case of Lencia Havoc, uh, in Sagami Bay at least, it's a very different distribution to that uh, found at Mbari. 
And as we've heard, we really do need to get genetic data on uh, some of these animals because sometimes you can't tell them apart morpho morphologically, but they may be different species. And it looks like we have uh, cryptic species for some of these small animals as well. Uh, unfortunately, no sequences for any of the Monterey stuff where most of the distribution uh, data comes from. Uh, but I'd really like to get this genetic information. Uh, the next areas we'd like to look at is the outflows from the Red Sea and the outflows from the Mediterranean Sea. So if anybody's going there on a cruise, can I come along? Uh, thank you very much. Is there any 